With this cassette tape, Dr. Howard C. Estep, president of World Prophetic Ministry Incorporated, begins a series of Bible study lectures, 20 lessons in the Old Testament book of Joshua. These messages were recorded before a Bible study audience in the beautiful King is Coming Auditorium at Colton, California. With your own Bible open, listen now as Dr. Estep begins the first Bible lesson from Joshua, chapter 1. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Joshua. It's an interesting book. The book of Joshua, it covers a period of about 30 years, from 1646 B.C. to 1616 B.C., 30-year period, the book of Joshua. It's a very interesting part. Joshua's part of the book was perhaps written at Gilgah in Canaan, as the events transpired from 1646 to 1616 B.C., when and by whom the postscript, that's chapters 24, verses 29 through 33, was written is not known, but Jewish tradition says that verse 29 through 32 of the last chapter was adopted or added by Eliezer, and verse 33 was added by Phinehas. The author, a man by the name of Joshua, he became the leader of Israel after Moses died. Moses died, and then Moses' ministry was turned over to Joshua. He is mentioned in the book of Joshua 171 times as the second great leader of Israel. He was a slave in Egypt, and at his death, was 110 years old, the same age as Joseph was when he died, which made Israel's second leader about 40 years old at the time of the exodus from Egypt. The theme of the book of Joshua, the book deals with the consummation of the redemption of Israel out of Egypt, for redemption has two parts out and into, according to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verse 23, it records the fulfillment of the prophecies of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses regarding the land of promise being given to Israel and the conquest and division of this land to them, all done by Joshua. little period of 30 years. We have a lesson outlined for you in the first chapter, 1, Israel's Second leader, Joshua, is commissioned, verses 1 through 9. Number two, Joshua assumes command. That's verses 10 through 15. And number three, Israel accepts her new leader, verses 16 through 18. And that concludes the first chapter of Joshua. And we're going to take 11 verses in chapter 2 in the first part is one spies sent out, verses 1 through 7 of chapter 2, and number 2, the success of those two spies in verses 8 through 11. We're endeavoring to cover about 30, 35 verses at each one of our Bible studies. This gives us roughly 45, 50 minutes of time to deal with the Bible verse by verse. So now we go to... Our lesson in chapter 1, the first part, Israel's second leader, Moses was the first, the second leader, Joshua, commission, beginning in verse 1. Now, after the death of Moses, Moses had died. Perhaps after the 30 days of mourning, as recorded in Deuteronomy 34, verse 8, about the first or second day of March, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua. After Moses had died, then God comes and he speaks to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, verse 2, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan. So here... He's commanded to go over the Jordan River because they're camped on one side 
when Moses died, they got to cross over the Jordan into the land of the Canaanites. So he is commissioned to go over the Jordan, this Jordan, the Jordan River, and all this people unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Now the land is occupied. There live the Canaanites and other pagan tribes in the land, but God is going to give victory to Joshua and the Israelites, and they're going to drive these pagan tribes out of the land. You say, well, that's rather cruel that God takes their land away from them and gives it to somebody else. Well, in the sense, maybe, but you must remember that God owns everything. This whole universe is God's. All that dwells therein belongs to God, and God can do with it whatever he wants to. So we can't criticize God because God started away back with Abram before he ever left the Ur of the Chaldees, and God says, I'm going to give you a land. Now he's in the process almost of the fulfillment of that prophecy. And this little book of Joshua covering a 30-year span explains what actually happened. So now we look at uh, the latter part of verse 2 again. And all this people unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel, every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. You notice that's past tense. He didn't say, I will give it to you. He says, I have given it. That have I given unto you. God in his mind had already given it. He gave it to Abram before Abram ever left the earth of the Chaldees. And right down through the lineage of Abram, right up here, to this particular point, some 1650 B.C., God is ready now to commission a man about 40 years of age by the name of Joshua who is going to step into the shoes of Moses and he's going to empower this man Joshua with the same power that he had given unto Moses. Showing you that God is no respecter of persons. And God always has leaders. God always has people to fill in and to take up the gap, fill in the vacancy. He says here in verse 3, Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. Verse 4, and he's going to give the boundaries of it now. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates. When it speaks in the Bible about the great river, it's referring to the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your coast. The great sea, the Mediterranean, and the going down of the sun goes down in the west. So the great sea in the west, the Mediterranean. It's interesting the way the Bible is written, but it means the same thing as we would read today in our modern vernacular. So Joshua is being commissioned. He's being told here what he's going to receive, what his responsibilities are going to be. He's going to, from the wilderness up to the country of Lebanon, all the way from the Euphrates over to the Mediterranean, all mentioned in verse 4, and that corresponds with Genesis chapter 15, verse 18. If you check the two verses side by side, you'll see that it's practically the same boundary marks or boundary lines. Verse 5, There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. A young man, 40 years of age approximately, Joshua, And he's going to lead these two million Israelites who have wandered 40 years coming up through the desert from Egypt. They have stopped at the Jordan River. Moses has died. So God now is going to take a new man, a fresh man. And he's telling this fresh new commander that uh, there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of your life. Everything you attempt to do in my name Under my direction, you'll be successful. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. So he's going to be with with, uh, 
with Joshua, the same as he was with Moses. And this promise was first made to Jacob way back in Genesis chapter 28. You see, God passes his promises down from one generation to another. So he's promising this fellow, Joshua, that he's going to be with him. He's going to undergird him physically, mentally, as I was with Moses. So I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Verse 6, be strong and of good courage. Don't lose your courage. Don't get downhearted. Don't be despondent. Don't look at the problems ahead of you and get to the place where you say, oh, the problems are too big. And sometimes that's the problem that faces we Christians when we are in a valley and we see circumstances surrounding us. We get to the place where we're despondent and we have uh, mental degrees of uh, sadness, etc. And we say, well, I don't think I can do it. But if God's on your side, you don't have anything to worry about. He's reaffirming his ability to provide to this man, Joshua, be strong and of good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land. So he's telling Joshua, you're going to divide all of this land up and distribute it to the different tribes. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give them, only be thou strong and very courageous. Very courageous. Don't be afraid of anything. I took a course in selling in 59. I wanted to see what salesmen were confronted with, and I went to Los Angeles, and I took a course in selling, and I learned one thing that most major sales are made on the seventh attempt. Most major sales are made on the seventh attempt. Most salesmen quit on the second attempt. So you have to stay right in there. You can't quit. You have to stay right in there. You can't let anything deter you. If they slam the door in your face, find you another door. And in this course on selling, they told the story of the man who was thrown out of an office on his sixth attempt to make a sale. And the man in the office literally threw him out and his satchel behind him and threw him outside. And the fellow got up, dusted off the dust, adjusted his tie, fixed his coat, picked up his satchel. And he said, now, in his mind, he said, now, this man really wants to buy. And he went back in. <laughs> Persistence. We have to be courageous. Be strong. Verse 7. Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law, observe the laws of Moses, which Moses my servant commanded thee, turn not from it to the right hand or to the left. And that's a good lesson right there for us. God's given us the Bible. He's given us the word. Why do you want to turn to the right or to the left? Why do you want to go off after some cult or some new fandangled religion that seemingly has uh, more charisma about it? God says, stay right by the word. That's what he told uh, Joshua 35, 3600 years ago. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. Stay right there in the center. You observe the commandments that Moses laid down, and those commandments were derived from the original Ten Commandments that God gave Moses on Mount Sinai. Moses, by inspiration, stretched them to 496 points known as the Mosaic Law. And the people had those laws to live by. And God is saying to Joshua, you stick right by the word, right by the law. Don't go to the right, don't go to the left. And this one thing this ministry is noted for across America, 
And I find this out as I talk to various men who come here, like Dr. Walvoord, who was recently with us in a Bible conference, and Ralph Gade, men of that caliber who come. And these men tell me that everywhere I go, you people are noted for your declaration of the word. We praise God for that. We're not going to turn to the right or to the left. Notice verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. Now he's referring to the one book of the law just completed by Moses and to which Joshua added his writings in uh, chapter 24, 26. That would be in Deuteronomy. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. Do everything that's written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. Good lesson for us. If we abide by the word of God, God has promised to make our ways prosperous. God will undergird us all the way if we stay by his word. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. It sounds like a a seminar on on selling or a seminar on uh, self-benefiting the individual, how to be a success in life. Well, according to the book of Joshua, which is a quotation of what God said to him, stay by the word. Stick by the word and God will prosper you and make you a success. Verse 9. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. So here we have Israel's second leader, Joshua, commissioned, chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. He's had direct dealings with God Almighty. God has told him exactly what I'm going to do because he has a tremendous task ahead of him. He has two million Israelites who've been wandering for 40 years in the desert on their way up from Egypt. There's a lot of discontentment. There's dissension. There's wrangling and all kinds of situations going on. He's dealing with 12 tribes. And so he's going to have to put these 12 tribes in certain parts of this land, which at this time they have not yet conquered. They've got to go over the Jordan. And when they get over there, then they're going to go into the land and they have to conquer it. And God's already said now, I'm going to bless you. You just stay by the word, don't go to the right or to the left, and I'll bless you, and you'll be a success. Joshua is going to assume command in verses 10 through 15. Verse 10 says, Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, So evidently, Joshua is accepting the challenge, because verse 11 says, Pass through the host and command the people, saying, Prepare you victuals or food. Prepare food for within three days ye shall pass over this Jordan. Now they're camped on the eastern side of the Jordan. They're camped on what would now be Jordan, the country of Jordan. So they're going to cross over into what is now known as the West Bank. So he says in three days we're going to go over. Get all the food ready that you're going to need. For within three days ye shall pass over this Jordan to go in to possess the land. It's a strange land. They've had previous stories in the days of Moses that it was occupied by giants. And the people were frightened. But now Joshua is saying in three days we're going to go over the Jordan. And the Jordan, why they're saying we're going over Jordan, is because at this particular time of the year which was probably March or April, the Jordan was in flood stage. And the waters was rushing down from Mount Hermon down through the Jordan Valley. And so the river was in flood stage and it was not 
the little stream that it is today in the summertime when we go over there on Bible Land Tours, you just roll up your trouser leg and walk across, no problem. But in that time, it was a flood stage, a roaring river. So we're going to pass over in three days, and we're going to possess the land. Positive thinking. He had his mind made up. He was going to obey what God told him. We're going over to possess the land which the Lord your God giveth you to possess it. Verse 12, And to the Reubenites and to the Gadites and to half the tribe of Manasseh spake Joshua, saying, Remember the word which Moses the servant of the Lord commanded you, saying, The Lord your God hath given you rest and hath given you this land. Your wives your little ones and your cattle shall remain in the land which Moses gave you on this side. So the wives and the children and the flocks or herds of cattle, sheep, goats, etc., are going to stay on the east side of the Jordan. But he's going to send a contingent of soldiers across the Jordan into the land to take it away from this tribe that now inhabits it. So it says here that the wives and the little ones and the cattle are going to remain in the land, but ye shall pass before your brethren armed. So they're going to be armed with their shields and their bucklers and their swords, etc. All the mighty men of valor and help them, verse 15, until the Lord have given your brethren rest. We're going over there, and we're going to fight. And we're going to take that land from them. Until the Lord have given your brethren rest, as he hath given you, and they also have possessed the land, which the Lord your God giveth them, then ye shall return unto the land of your possessions. Then you'll come back for your wives, your children, and your flocks, etc., and enjoy it, which Moses the Lord's servant gave you on this side, Jordan, toward the sun rising, on the eastern side of the, of the river, Jordan. So here we have Joshua assuming command. And you'll notice one thing uh, that struck me as I was uh, reviewing my mind relative to this lesson. He had a plan. God commissioned him in verses 1 through 9, but when we come to verses 10 through uh, 15, he immediately revealed his plan. Evidently, he had been thinking about this thing. And God talking to him in verses 1 through 9, then he must have sat down in his tent, or probably a tent, maybe in the shade of a lean-to or something, maybe under a tree. Anyhow, he sat down with his officers around him because he had two million people. It wasn't a Boy Scout outing. It was a tremendous moving of human beings through the country. And now this responsibility is all thrust upon the shoulders of this young man, Joshua. All of the food, all of the medical. If you just stop and think how much care two million people require... And suddenly this young man of 40 years of age is put in charge of all of that tremendous responsibility. But he had a plan because he exercises the plan in verses 10 through 15. He tells immediately what he's going to do. And this is what I want you to do. And it's quite interesting as we go into the next three verses. I think you'll be impressed with his authority as we look at Israel accepts her new leader. In verses 16 through 18, verse 16 says, And they answered Joshua, saying, when he gave him all of these rules and regulations, and he told him what he, they were going to do. Verse 16, They answered Joshua, saying, All that thou commandest us, we will do, and whithersoever thou sendest us, we will go. Here we have consecration, real consecration. Whatever he told them, they said, we'll do it. 
the church of the Lord Jesus Christ would have won much of this world's population if the members of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ had been consecrated. We don't have real consecration in the church anymore. But those Israelites were consecrated because they were standing at a point in history where if they failed, they could have been wiped out as a nation. And yet they're going to go into a land that they have not been in before and they're going to face up against an enemy. They don't know really how hostile this enemy is. But they're ready to commit themselves to the end because they say here in verse 16, All that thou commandest us we will do and whithersoever thou sendest us we will go, whatever you say, wherever you want us to go, whatever you want us to do. It's hard to get people to really knuckle down today and do the work of the Lord. That's why our churches are so lukewarm. That's why so many churches around America are without a pastor. People won't cooperate. I had a pastor in my office this week. And he's a a fine pastor. He has a good education. He's a godly man. He's a family man. Uh, He's pastored about four or five churches since he came out of seminary. And he was talking about his church. He said, I can't get him to, to cooperate. He said, I've got some that are satisfied to just sit. They don't want to do anything. They're satisfied with what they have. They don't want to even screw in a new light bulb. They just want to sit and take it easy. And he says, I've got another group that want to push ahead. And he says, we got we got contention in our own church. Now, if Joshua had had a church like that, notice what would have happened. Quite interesting. Verse 17. According as we hearkened unto Moses in all things, the Israelites are saying, so will we hearken unto thee. As we obeyed Moses, we're going to obey you. Only the Lord thy God be with thee as he was with Moses. Now it was only natural to expect God to be with Joshua, the new leader, as he was with Moses, who became their ideal and the example for others to follow, even the example which Jesus Christ, the ideal and the perfect example for Christians. Verse 18, this is the thrust that really tied the, the load of hay on the wagon. Notice what it says in verse 18. Whosoever he be that doth rebel against thy commandment and will not hearken unto thy words in all that thou commandest him, he shall be put to death. <laughs> We don't have anything like that today. If Jesus Christ had said in the Great Commission, go you out into all the world and uh, make disciples of men, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all of those who do not cooperate, have them executed. What a great commission that would have been. The whole country would have been bloody. It's hard to get people to really knuckle down. They don't really want to. They only take God as a convenience, basically. Just as a convenience. For instance, this auditorium on Saturday night, we can fill it up with three or four hundred people. But they come for a free movie. But those same people won't come to a Bible conference They won't come to a Friday night Bible class. They won't come to a Sunday afternoon prophetic rally. They only want to come to get a free movie so their kids will have somewhere to go. What I'm saying is that the church is not really consecrated. Very few Christians are what we say sold out for God. 
But uh, Joshua had a way of overcoming that. Those who rebel against thy commandment and will not listen to the words in all that thou commandest him, he shall be put to death. In other words, martial law was necessary and wholehearted agreement of all the men of the war to such death penalty made it easier for Joshua to be strong and of good courage. They had military rule. When Joshua took over the tribes of Israel when Moses died, by insubordination their fathers had caused failure 40 years before, so now to assume against failure, this penalty was agreed upon for anyone who refused to obey the commander-in-chief. According to verse 18, the latter part of that verse, only be strong and of good courage. So Israel accepted her new leader, who was freshly commissioned of God. And now Joshua ties in the whole thing. And he says, if we're going to win this war, if we're going to take this land away from the Hittites and the Canaanites, etc., if we're going to take it away from these pagan tribes, we're all going to have to work together. We're going to have to have complete unity. If we don't all agree, it won't work. We won't be able to get the job done. And so as he got his counsel around him, as he gathered the counsel around him, they agreed upon the death penalty. We'll enact martial law. And anybody that doesn't cooperate, we'll put him to death. And that will scare the daylights out of those who had a little idea that they were not going to cooperate. Now they'll be willing to cooperate. Proof that capital punishment works if it was enforced. But the laws of the land don't enforce it. There's something like 400 people sitting on death row right now. Some of them have been there seven, eight, and nine years. But the laws don't execute so we keep having murders. We keep having all of the crimes against uh, humanity that are performed which carry the penalty of death, but nobody does anything about it. But Joshua, 3,600 years ago, put the thing into operation and it functioned. Let's go to chapter 2 because Joshua is going to send out two spies. Originally, under Moses, they sent out 12 spies. Now they're going to send out two spies in verses 1 through 7, And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly. Two men are going to go out and they're going to spy secretly. This uh, was the east campsite of Israel before entering Canaan. Two men to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land. Go slip across the Jordan. And go into the land, they were disguised evidently, go into the land, even Jericho, go down into the city of Jericho, probably the oldest known city on planet earth today is the city of Jericho, go into Jericho, and they went and came into an harlot's house. Now evidently this was uh, an inn, something like we would call a hotel, but not comparable to our inns or hotels or motels today. But they went to this inn, and it was the harlot's house, and the woman was Rahabed and, and, uh, Rahab, and she lodged there. This is where she operated out of Rahab. Quite interesting. This was Rahab of the genealogy of Christ, and nothing is to be gained by trying to soften facts about her because of that. So the two spies land in the local inn or the local motel and uh, the uh, gal there that seems to be having all of the business is a gal by the name of Rahab, a harlot. Verse 2. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in hither tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. Naturally, the Canaanites and the Hittites in this land knew that this two million Israelites were camped on the other side of Jordan. 
No way in the world they could keep from knowing about it. Because you put two million people over on that side of the river in the Jordan Valley, and the dust from their animals and the barking of the dogs and the people singing and all of the noise going on, somebody would have to hear about it. It was told the king of Jericho, Behold, there came men in hither tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho said unto Rahab, saying, or sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee. In other words, she was a very popular gal in town. And the word got out that two men had gone to her place, her room or her apartment or her part of this uh, building, wherever it was there in Jericho. And bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thine house. For they be come to search out all the land. These are spies. These are men who have come to search out the land. It's quite interesting. Rahab was perhaps an innkeeper. She could have had a little business going there on the side. She was running a little hotel, a little inn. She was an innkeeper and had uh, brought the spies to the roof of her house, hiding them among the stalks of flax. Over there they have flat roofs. In Bible times they had a flat roof because they went up on top of the roof and that's where they sunned themselves or they spread out fruits to dry uh, various uses of the top of the house. Didn't have a peaked roof like we have today. So uh, something's going to happen in verse 4. The woman took the two men and hid them and said thus, there came men unto me, but I wist not whence they were. Rahab was perhaps an innkeeper, and she's trying to cover the thing up because, you see, God is involved in this. God is going to protect these two spies because God is going to give them the lay of the land so they can go back and tell Joshua because God has already told Joshua in the first chapter, he says, if you stay right by the word and you be strong and you be courageous and don't become flustered, don't become upset, don't become nervous and full of anxiety, I'm going to bless you and you'll be a tremendous success. So he's exercising his plan by sending the two spies into the land. And verse 4 says, And the woman took the two men, hid them, and said thus, There came men unto me, but I wish not whence they were. They've gone. They were here, but they've gone. They were here earlier in the day, but they're gone now. Verse 5, And it came to pass about the time of shutting of the gate. Jericho had gates, had a wall around it. And they shut the gate at sundown. At sundown, the big gate was shut. And animals, people couldn't get in, except they went through the little gate. There was a small gate beside the little gate called the needle's eye. And so they could pass through the small gate, the needle's eye. And about the time of shutting of the gate, when it was dark, that the men went out, the two spies slipped out, Whither the men went, I want not pursue after them quickly, for ye shall overtake them. So she's really telling a lie. But first of all, she's a prostitute. She's deep in sin to start with. But sometimes God uses wicked people to perform his work. And this is a clear-cut case of where God is using a woman of... Uh, uh, not too good a reputation to lay the groundwork to accomplish something for God. So she's saying, well, they went out. They slipped out through the gate at, at dark. I don't know where they went, but she's telling a lie. Okay, let's follow this through. She does say in the latter part of verse 5, pursue after them quickly for ye shall overtake them. If you'll hurry, you'll catch them. Verse 6, but she had brought them up to the roof of the house. The flat roofs of eastern houses, being exposed to the sun and air, were well adapted for the ripening or drying of fruit and grain. 
and they had uh, flax stored up there, piled up on the roof to dry. And this made a good hiding place for the spies. So she brought them up on to the roof of the house and hid them with the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order upon the roof. And the men pursued after them the way of Jordan unto the fords. Now the men in Jericho went out the gate and they went down to the river Jordan. And they went along the Jordan evidently looking for footprints, tracks, to see if they could track down these two men that had been in the city of Jericho. And in all reality, they're still in the city of Jericho. They are spies from Joshua's mighty army. They've come to get the lay of the land. Notice what it says, verse 7, And the men pursued after them the way of Jordan, or the way to Jordan under the fords. And as soon as they which pursued after them were gone out, they shut the gate. In other words, the gates of walled towns were always shut at sundown or shortly thereafter. So the men pursuing the supposed spies are outside. The spies are inside. They're up on top of the roof. They're covered over. They're ready for a good night's rest to protect it. God arranged all of that. God told Joshua originally, he said, I'm going to give you complete success. Everything you do is going to be a success. All you have to do is to abide by the law that Moses laid down. You abide by the law. Be strong. Be courageous. And as long as you do that, I'll bless you. Everything will become a success. Now notice the success of the spies in verses 8 through 11. And before they were laid down, she came up unto them unto the roof. Before they went to sleep, Rahab came up to them upon the roof, and they made an agreement. This woman of ill repute is going to enter into an agreement with the two spies, and here we get the agreement. Verse 9. And she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land. It's rather strange, but God does deal with wicked people sometimes. In the Old Testament, God did. We have a perfect example here. A woman of an unsavory reputation has the knowledge that God is involved in this whole transaction. She said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land and that your terror is fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. She's telling the two spies what they need to know because she's heard conversation as she's gone down to the market and round and about and people have come through where she lives uh, she's heard the rumors and she knows that the the people in Jericho and on that western bank of the Jordan know about the two million Israelites over on the other side and she's telling the two spies exactly what they need to know. They don't have to go out and subject themselves to being arrested or caught or executed or etc. Verse 10, For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you. The miracle of the drying up of the Red Sea as they came up from Egypt has already gotten up through the land and there they know about it in Jericho. Because she says, we have heard how the Lord dried up the water. When ye came out of Egypt and what ye did unto the key, to the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, Shehan and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. We've heard how you were successful in other battles. You see, God allowed this rumor to get up into this uncivilized area among the Hittites and the Canaanites, etc. God allowed this to get up there to, to cause their hearts to faint, to cause them to be afraid. And so... Uh, Rahab is telling the two spies what she knows about it. Verse 11. And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt. We were afraid that you were going to come and take Jericho away from us. Our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. God put the fear in their hearts. 
You see, God said, I'm going to give you the land. He told Moses that. He told, uh, actually, he told uh, Abram that before Abram ever left the land of the Ur of the Chaldees. He said, I'm going to give you the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. And that was some 400 years before Joshua that God told Abram that. Now God has put fear in the hearts of the Canaanites and the Hittites, and they're ready to, to fly. If someone had a shot at 22, those guys would have taken off like a, a motocross motorcycle race across the desert. You couldn't have caught them for the dust. They were ready to go, leave town immediately without their luggage. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you, for the Lord your God. This is Rahab talking. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. And all Canaanites were made to recognize that the true and living God was back of the Israelites and that by his power these miracles were wrought. The drying up of the Red Sea. The battles in the southern part of the state of Israel. What is now known as the state of Israel. All of this success this pagan tribe was made to realize that all of that was accomplished by the God of heaven, who was the God of the Israelites. A tremendous message here. If there are any Christians here that are downhearted and you're discouraged and uh, you're kind of wishy-washy and you don't know which way to turn and you're at the point in life where you're ready to throw up your hands and say, oh, well, what's the use? All you got to do is read the uh, first chapter of the book of Joshua. Can't do anything but encourage you. Because it says plainly that if you'll do what the word of God tells you, you don't have any problems. God will solve all your problems, whatever they are. And I have as many problems as any of you, and God's going to solve our problems. We just have to trust God. We have to believe God. We have to live above our daily circumstances. We cannot allow our daily circumstances to pull us down and become the victor in our lives. 